regarded as one of the top silver experts. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, Happy New Year to everyone, and thank you, Elijah, for having me back. Appreciate it. Definitely. Happy New Year. And um, yeah, I mean, the first topic, since it is, uh, we are uh, going into the new year, what is your perspective on where we've been this year in precious metals, if we want to start off with that? Gold is down 2% and silver is down 10%. Then also, where are we headed in 2019? Yeah, it's been obviously a lackluster year for the precious metals outside of palladium. And all, in fact, almost all the base metals, except for uh, Molly and one or two others. So where we're headed, uh, you know, I feel like a broken record. And of course, forecasting, you know, when I forecast, I mean, I'll give a forecast because everyone wants to know. But, you know, like anything in life, I correct and continue, correct and continue, correct and continue. I mean, you know, being having a pilot's license, I mean, when you plot a, you know, a course line from point A to point B, no one, not even uh, an autopilot, flies that perfectly. There's always constant corrections being made. So you know, that's how I operate. So I think I made a statement like years ago that I saw the stock market at a high of around 22,000. And I know we've been well beyond that. <clears throat> we've, we're actually down near that level right now. But I'm looking at uh, a good year for the metals and how good, I don't know. I think we could expect to see something like 10 to 20 percent in gold. Last year, uh, near the beginning of 2018, I put a survey out on my Twitter feed, which is at SilverGuru22, and I got a lot of responses on my Twitter feed. I asked who thinks that silver will outperform gold this year and who thinks gold will outperform silver. 75% thought that silver would outperform gold. 25% thought gold would outperform silver. Obviously, gold lost less during the year, so that's the correct answer. In a bull market, silver almost always outperforms, so that's one of the keys so I know I've said a lot, Elijah, you can reel me back in, but I'm looking for stocks. I think they've peaked. I think we're going to see a mediocre to poor year for stocks, whether or not there's a continuing decline that's, you know, monumental, meaning, you know, two, two, three, four percent a day or not continuing. I don't I don't know, but I do think that there'll be a shift. So that's the main key I takeaway. The main takeaway is that we're going to shift out of equities and into metals. I think that is going to take place in 2019. No, yeah, I mean, it was the worst year for stocks since 2008. So you're seeing that continuing? I am. Usually these trends, I mean, that's another thing about, you know, what I do and how I trade. I mean, you're a lot better off letting the trend be established rather than do what's human nature, which is try to pick the top or the bottom or say it's going to get to X. You got to actually work with what the market gives you. But I think that's the case. I think this is going to be a major trend that overall equities down and metals up. Now, what are some of the main bullish factors for precious metals in 2019? Well, one is uh, there's <clears throat> awareness is already uh, prevalent. In other words, all the people who got scared out or, or worn out or scared out during this six-year doldrums of the market going basically down, they're aware of the market. Now, some of them are burned or, you know, had a you know, problem of some type or another, dealer defaulted or, you know, whatever. They'll never come back to the market, but uh, a vast majority of them are aware of the market. And some of those, in fact, most, probably 80 percent or so, will come back to the market. So that's one thing they have going for it. The other thing is managed money. Uh, money managers know through Europe, but throughout the U.S. too, not everyone uses a wealth manager in the States. But nonetheless, uh, they'll be. Uh, the momentum players. In other words, people see what's moving, what, what I just said a moment ago. Well, look for the trend. If the trend is established, it's a pretty strong trend, then you'll see more and more movement into the trend that's moving up and less and less into the trend that's moving down. So you'll see basically a reverse of what we've seen for six years. I think you'll see a movement that starts rather slowly and modestly in the metals going higher and the equities going lower. And, of course, the bond market is always a big question mark as well. But I think the bond market, of course, is having its problems with an inverted yield curve and the Fed being somewhat dovish, but also promising more or less to, to have two uh, rate increases next year. So almost everything is favorable. As far as any fundamental change, you know, into like there's this big need for silver because of, you know, this new whatever. I don't see that right now, although I'll be always looking for that. Uh, gold, it's basically safe haven. You look at, you know, China, Russia, they haven't slowed down. 
and the central banks actually haven't slowed down that much either. So even though it's uh, maligned on the mainstream press, it's actually coveted by most of the central banks. They've been net buyers for quite some time. Now, regarding what the Fed will do in 2019, what is your perspective? Do you think they're going to be more dovish or hawkish? I think dovish. I think they probably will do probably two more rate increases. The pro they're in a corner. They're in a box. They are really in a fix. I mean, in order for them to really have much ability to cut when they need to, when the recession is acknowledged by them, which will be about six months after it really is started, they don't have a lot of cutting they can do from this point on the on the interest rate curve. But and they may raise it again a couple times. They really need to get, you know, from historic standpoints to like a 5% yield. But I don't think they could go that high. So they can up it a little bit and then they can cut it from there. But it won't have much effect. What's really interesting is almost anybody in this genre knows is how much they cut interest rates to practically zero and how little real wealth creation was established was an asset bubble, the prices of pieces of paper with companies' names on them went higher, but the real physical economy really didn't benefit that much. And so this time, they have less room to cut, and they'll probably get even less response out of an outpour of another QE or whatever they decide to do. So we're in a situation where most of us have talked about for years and years, and you know, we get maligned by people that, well, it's never happened. Well, folks, it did happen. It happened in 2008. For a fact, we never really recovered. And we're set up for a situation very similar to 2008. And actually, from a debt perspective and a derivative perspective, we're worse off than we were then, which means we're in a situation that once this manifests, it probably will be somewhat worse than what we already experienced in 2008 and may not be uh, reconciled as quote unquote, easily as it was in the last financial crisis. Now, you're mentioning how if we do see this, you know, recession uh, happening in 2019, that the Fed doesn't have much room to lower interest rates because interest rates are still very low. But they I mean, they would have a lot of room, you know, potentially infinite to, you know, do more quantitative easing. Uh, so what is your perspective on that? Can they come to the rescue through that uh, medium? Well, yes, until it's defaulted on because people default on the currency. They get print so much. People say it's becoming worth less and it's coming worth less and it's becoming worthless. So they rather, you know, buy something of tangible wealth like a jar of peanut butter or, you know, some piece of clothing or some, uh, you know, soap product or cleaner or whatever rather than hold on to it. So that's the possibility Will that happen in the U.S. or not remains to be determined. The other aspect is the market could actually take over the yield curve, uh, which hasn't happened in a long time. Instead of the banks basically having control, the uh, bond vigilantes return in force and say, you know, even though you're paying me this, you know, 4%, I'm making up the number. That's not where we're at right now. That's not enough. There's too much risk holding dollars right now. I want more. And that's a possibility. So I don't rule that out either. But in either case, you either default on the bond and you say, well, we can't pay these back. We're going to get, you know, you're going to get 50 cents on the dollar. You're going to get zero or whatever happens. Or you just keep printing and printing and printing until the masses wake up to the fact that there's no way out. And the only thing that the government's going to do is to borrow more from the, from the bankers until the currency is basically um, not trusted anymore. So you either quit trusting the bond market or you, know, you quit trusting the currency market, and they're, of course, tied together, obviously, but it's a loss of faith. And a loss of faith is most likely in the currency sector. Uh, Jim Poplava did a study several years ago, and any non-backed monetary system, all have failed, by the way. So people that, you know, anyway, I won't go down that rabbit hole. So all have failed. <clears throat> this one is failing. We're only arguing about the last two or three pennies worth out of the 1913 dollars. So think about that. But what we're arguing about is, is it going to fail, you know, quickly, slowly? Am I going to be able to see it? And what do I do about it? And, of course, all those are more or less to be determined. But what we do know from history is that you want to have an asset class, if you have assets to protect, that have shown to protect them during such interesting times. 
And if you don't, you want to be prepared for disruption in your normal supply chain, you as a household, meaning, you know, your foodstuffs, you know, water, electricity, whatever that might be. And I'm not predicting any of this is going to happen, although it's tending to trend that direction. You just want to be prepared, at least mentally, that there could be some um, some times ahead that are more unpredictable than they are right now, especially if, as Bill Holter says, you know, and he's correct, you know, when the credit bubble bursts and you can't get credit to stock inventory or to get transportation to your next uh, big box store, then all those goods don't get transported. So that becomes a transportation problem. Uh, that's built off of the back of the credit system. So there's a lot of things that are intertwined that people don't really think about that could happen actually fairly rapidly once this trust is lost. And once it's lost, it's rather difficult to get it back. And that's why we came so close in 2008 to actually having a worse situation than we when we had. I mean, Lehman and Bear, you know, I mean, two very trusted institutions one day off the map the next day, more or less, you know, within, you know, within just a little bit of time. And so uh, had maybe three or four more gone, that might have been enough that really solid institutions might not have been trusted because people say, well, you know, this one, this one, this one, this one have all failed. Well, mine's next. I'm getting out. So, you know, there's a lot of fear that can be generated from this stuff. And I'll just um, add on to that, that it's happened in the past. Um, it is scary or it could be scary, but it's nothing to really panic about, especially if you're prepared for something similar to what I'm outlining taking place. Now, will all this take place in 2019? No. Will we see a recession in 2019? Mm, probably will, but it probably won't be acknowledged until 2020. So, David, when do you see this, you know, next 2008 type of situation? I don't see it, Elijah, probably until 2022, uh, 2023, maybe, somewhere in there. I think we have... Enough ammunition in the system and enough momentum. I mean, the stocks are so overpriced now just to get to fair value. They have to get back to where they ended in 2008. So they have to go below that on an inflation-adjusted basis because these numbers are meaningless these days because of the inflation that isn't really reported accurately. But the idea is we really didn't get that undervalued in 2008. So look at it as a longer-term prediction. David isn't saying 2019 is when it happens. I doubt it highly. I doubt it'll be 2020. I think by 2020 is when you'll start to see more real momentum come into the metals. It'll start to be like we saw in the early 2000s, you know, 2004, 5, 6 kind of a thing where, hmm, that's kind of a cool place to be. Yeah, they've moved a lot, but they've got a lot longer you know, to move. I mean, people don't remember, some do, that gold had an 11-year uptrend. I mean, for 11 years, year over year, gold was higher than the year before. And as you just said at the start of the show, gold is off 2% this year. So, you know, uh, those years of year over year increases in the precious metals, I think, are ahead of us, not, you know, are coming ahead of us. I think the ones that are lower are behind us. So time will tell if I'm correct or not. Now, you had mentioned in a video that you're looking for a recession in 2019. What concretely do you think that'll look like? Well, I think it'll start rather nominally. I think, you know, there'll be higher unemployment, obviously more people going to, you know, unemployment and food stamps and that type of thing. Uh, more people that are discouraged to find jobs. I think it'll start slowly. I think it'll be uh, broad brushed by the press. It depends what they want to do with it. I and mean, if they want to make, you know, blame it on Trump, which seems like that's kind of how the press is, then they'll make a bigger deal out of it. <clears throat> but I think it'll start gaining momentum over time. In other words, you know, there's a lot of things working against the U.S. worker. I mean, you've got competition in, you know, foreign countries where, you know, uh, Chinese type would be able to do the job for, you know, one third, one fourth, one fifth the price of a U.S. person. You've got robotics, which is e eating up, you know, tons of jobs. I mean, look at an automobile manufacturing plant now and tell me how many people are on there that compared to the time when I was your age, Elijah. I mean, so you have robotics coming in. You've got AI throughout the, um, the sector, meaning, you know, manufacturing sector, supply chain, transportation, I mean, even Amazon has a lot of their stuff done by robotics. So this is um, a trend or it's harder and harder for you know people to find meaningful employment, let alone empl employment of any type whatsoever. So we're in a situation where you're going to see contraction 
in real wages, which we've seen for a long time, but it'll be more meaningful. So I see the recession getting worse over time and recognition of it by the people um, almost immediately, but by the press, I'm not sure which way they'll stand on it or what they'll make out of it. I think it, you know, however it serves them best to turn it into propaganda. But for the real person out there listening to this podcast, the main idea is to live within your means, have low debt, you know, save if you can. And if your savings isn't in money, and I realize a lot of people these days can't do that, then save in, you know, food that you really consume. You know, the worst thing I think about the quote unquote prepper thing, and and I am one, is to prep in stuff that you really don't like, you know, buying something that's, uh, you know, freeze dried or whatever. I'm not against it. I have some and I like it, but I researched what I liked and what I didn't like. So, you know, if you do canned food or whatever, I mean, just buy more of what you actually use, what actually eat, you know, you're going to enjoy rather than trying to go off on a limb and find something that, you know, is a great price or a good deal or whatever. If you're going to explore out then do it in a small way and determine whether or not you really want it or not. Definitely. And looking into that, I mean, what is your perspective on, do you think people should take action right now to prepare for this coming crash? Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm fond of saying I'd rather be six months too early than six months too late. I mean, if you've ever been in a hurricane situation, and I've only been in one twice in my life, uh, when I used to have a business in Florida, uh, it's, <laughs> it's an eye opener, you know, I mean, a lot of people just rush to the store to buy water, basically, and other stuff. Um, and so you want to be the one that's at home with your water. You know, you don't want to have to fire up the car when the wind's blowing or it's raining sideways. You know, so, yeah, I would say, you know, within your means, you don't have to go overboard. Everyone kind of has to determine. I mean, you know, a lot of this is just uh, sponsored by the government now. I mean, if you look at some of the .gov websites, they'll tell you now. I think it's up to six months, is it not? You can correct me that, uh, you know, people they used to say, you know, have a couple weeks, have three days worth of supplies. You know, and now it's like, it's gone in two weeks, and now I think it's up to months. So I'm not sure what the government is trying to, um, you know, send out as far as messaging is concerned. But nonetheless, I think they've increased what they used to say as far as the amount of days of preparation that you might consider. Definitely. I think that's uh, something we can all uh, uh, consider. I guess before we let you go, um, were there any last thoughts you'd like to add, and where can we find you online, David? You know, I definitely wish everybody – a very happy uh, New Year. I want them to have a prosperous one. That's not always meaning in money. Prosperous can be, you know, getting that job that you really like or writing that book that you always wanted to write or anything else that, you know, you've got a fire in your belly to do. I suggest you, you know, do it. It's a new year. It's a new time and get on with it. I am going to be doing a uh, video update that will be public domain. It'll be on a webinar basis and I'll be doing the markets overview for 2019. So, Kind of a graphic form of what we just did. I'll be looking at stocks. I'll be looking at the metals. I'll be looking at bonds. I'll be looking at the dollar. I'll be looking at Bitcoin. Hopefully, I can keep it down in about 20 minutes. So if you're not on the free list, get on the morganreport.com. Get on our free list, and then you'll be notified when I have that webinar up, and you can participate. So that's it. I have nothing more to add. Thank you. Awesome. Once again, David, thank you so much for your time. Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm fond of saying I'd rather be six months too early than six months too late. I mean, if you've ever been in a hurricane situation, and I've only been in one twice in my life uh, when I used to have a business in Florida, uh, it's <laughs> it's an eye opener. You know, I mean, a lot of people just rush to the store to buy water, basically, and other stuff. Um, and so you want to be the one that's at home with your water. You know, you don't want to have to fire up the car when the wind's blowing or it's raining sideways. You know, so, yeah, I would say, you know, within your means, you don't have to go overboard. Everyone kind of has to determine. I mean, you know, a lot of this is just uh, sponsored by the government now. I mean, if you look at some of the .gov websites, they'll tell you now. I think it's up to six months, is it not? You can correct me that, uh, you know, people they used to say, you know, have a couple weeks, have three days worth of supplies. You know, and now it's like, it's gone in two weeks. Now I think it's up to months. So I'm not sure what the government is trying to, um, 
you know, send out as far as messaging is concerned. But nonetheless, I think they've increased what they used to say as far as the amount of days of preparation that you might consider. Definitely. I think that's uh, something we can all uh, uh, consider. I guess before we let you go, um, were there any last thoughts you'd like to add? And where can we find you online, David? You know, I definitely wish everybody a very happy uh, New Year. I want them to have a prosperous one. That's not always meaning in money. Prosperous can be, you know, getting that job that you really like or writing that book that you always wanted to write or anything else that, you know, you've got a fire in your belly to do. I suggest you, you know, do it. It's a new year. It's a new time and get on with it. I am going to be doing a uh, video update that will be public domain. It'll be on a webinar basis, and I'll be doing the markets overview for 2019. So kind of a graphic form of what we just did. I'll be looking at stocks. I'll be looking at the metals. I'll be looking at bonds. I'll be looking at the dollar. I'll be looking at Bitcoin. Hopefully, I can keep it down to about 20 minutes. So if you're not on the free list, get on the morganreport.com. Get on our free list, and then you'll be notified when I have that webinar up and you can participate. So that's it. I have nothing more to add. Thank you. Awesome. Once again, David, thank you so much for your time.